right, so look, let me just get started and I'll just um, introduce myself. So my, my name is Lynn Magor Blatch and I'm the Executive Officer with the Australasian Therapeutic Communities Association. And the ATCA covers New Zealand and Australia. Um, my history in TCs goes back to 1974 when I started work at the Lee Community in Oxford and my first lot of training was to be put as a resident for five weeks at Alpha House in Portsmouth, but I actually went to Alpha House for three months for training. So I was a bit of a rarity. I was the first person who hadn't gone through a program in the UK to be trained in a program. So a bit of a guinea pig. Um, I managed to survive it, and here I am still, you know, kind of in the, the TC movement all these years later. I've kind of been in and out of it a bit. Um, I have also um, retrained in some ways as a psychologist, so I'm both a clinical as well as a forensic psychologist. So I have part of my life I spend as an executive officer of the ATCA and the other part of my life uh, working in the university system um, and also in private practice. So that's a bit about me. Now, this is what I thought we would try and do today. You see I've got introductions up there, but I guess uh, you know it's a little bit difficult to go around and, and find out about everybody. What we have done at least is find out where you are in terms of your working situation. Um, and hopefully as the workshop goes on, we'll find out a bit more about you. So these are the things that I just want to go over fairly briefly, in fact, so that we can hopefully get down to the practice workshop. I have to tell you that um, on the way here I kissed the Blarney stone, um, and so, you know, <laughs> I hope I'm not full of Blarney. I'm supposed to be a lot more kind of eloquent. That's what it's supposed to be. Okay, so look, some early beginnings as to how Australian and New Zealand TCs came about. Because in lots of ways we, have, we take our history both from America and also from the UK. Uh, and in part, that's also because uh, some of us came from different systems, particularly um, myself and also Charlie Blatch was um, at uh, the Lee community. Um, he was there as the assistant director when I came to the, pro came to the program. <coughs> and he and I both then went back to Australia uh, further on down the track. And others, of course, came from, from the US. So particularly when we come to this uh, process, uh, which was echoed by Dr. Bert Bertram Mandelbrot, so Bertie um, <coughs> came to the Livermore Hospital and he set up the Livermore Hospital uh, program. So, um, <coughs> and the interesting thing about Bertie, so he was there when I arrived at the Lee uh, community, and you can see there's also a very young, uh, a very young Martin um, there as well, uh, and also Dr. Peter M uh, Agulnik, who were part of the Lee community. So that kind of process had started coming, and, and, and very much the UK <coughs> situation was that the TCs came out of the mental health hospitals. So the Littlemore Hospital, which is where uh, Peter and uh, Bertie were, and um, the St James Hospital uh, in um, uh, in Portsmouth, where Ian Christie was. That's not Ian Christie at the top photo, but that's me, with uh, my dear friend Dale Fletcher, who some of you may know, those of you who come from the UK. Um, so this was kind of a really exciting time, of course, in the history of TCs in the UK. But they were also influenced very much by the fact that um, the person who came over to run the Lee community was John McCabe, who came from Phoenix House in, um, in New York. And also at the same time, uh, Ian Christie and Jane Green, his wife, who's a psychologist, Ian was a psychiatrist, went to the US and put themselves in, this is where they got the great idea of putting me in the program, of course, put themselves into a program as well, or programs in order to train. So you started to get this blend of, of um, history, really, of the UK and the US method coming together. So then what happened, of course, when um, 
uh, and in America and uh, you know we have people here today who can tell us the real history of course of Sinanon, the Sinanon model, but very much um, you had the Sinanon model as being the, the main influence happening in the US. Um, and again, as I said, in the 60s and 70s, you start to get that blending of the early traditions. The self-help tradition uh, begins to merge with professional practices of staffing in the UK. Uh, and we all started to get this idea that, in fact, a blend of staff, those who are in recovery, those who've gone through a program, as well as people coming in from outside with, a, with other professional training, was a good blend for the TC model. So when we come to Australia, both these models are brought to Australia and, and start to be blended or modelled uh, and modified for Australian populations. The We Help Ourselves program, WHO's, was the first one that was set up in Australia in 1972 in New South Wales. Um, it's the second photo down here on the right hand side. The buttery, which was literally in a, uh, an old buttery. Um, in northern New South Wales, we were very much a kind of a hippie community in the beginning of, the, of uh, its establishment in 1973. And then you had Odyssey House in New South Wales and also Victoria established in 1976. Um, and the interesting thing about Odyssey was that actually the people who set it up first of all came to the UK and engaged with Alpha House. And <coughs> For, you know, it could very easily have not been an Odyssey model in Australia, but in fact an Alpha model or Phoenix House model uh, coming over to Australia instead. Um, so, you know, all of those kind of histories and, and you know, certainly represented there by James uh, Pitts, who was uh, till recently the CEO of Odyssey in New South Wales, and of course George and Martin. Um, there as well, all bringing those kind of influences into the Australian system. Um, the Alcohol and Drug Foundation ACT, or ADFACT, was established in 1976 by four doctors who were looking for an alternative. And I think these are really kind of interesting, you know, historical moves, because when you consider that Australian, the, the establishment of Australian TCs was not that far behind what was happening in the UK and the US, and yet we were right over there um, you know, largely without a great deal of influence coming from, from, um, from people bringing it over to Australia initially. But very much, you know, we also had um, medical doctors, and though these four doctors, some of them are still involved in, uh, in working in Canberra, um, looking for an alternative method. They were saying, we have to do something other than just have a medical model. So I think that, you know, it was a really interesting kind of time. Kalara House was established by Charlie Blatch uh, in Granier in 1979 uh, in what was in fact an old pub um, in this country community. Um, and so I guess, you know, very much then the English kind of tradition started to come into, into Australia. Now there was a very significant thing happened in 1985. Our then Prime Minister, uh, Bob Hawke, broke down on TV uh, and was, was talking about his daughter, Ross, who was um, a heroin user. And subsequent to that, the Premier's Conference in 1985 then established the National Campaign Against Drug Abuse. And the interesting thing that happened, it was down in Melbourne, the interesting thing that happened was that they brought people from all over Australia together. There were doctors and nurses and psychiatrists and people who were working in the addictions field. And so after a number of plenary sessions, they asked people to get into their groups and to go into different rooms and to start kind of working through, you know, what they would see as their vision for where they needed to see funding and support services going. And what happened was that there was this group of people who were kind of left in the foyer um, and didn't actually fit into anything and they were all, all the TC people. And so some of them had been working without really knowing each other very well, um, and so they started to then get together. And, and from that, in 1986, the ATCA was founded uh, at a first meeting at Odyssey House in Melbourne. So 
the interesting thing that has uh, we've seen over time, um, and we've started to do since that time, we've worked very hard to uh, establish the TC model um, within our programs. But what we started to see, of course, was that there was um, that there was a, a continuum where, in many ways, TCs were considered to be at one end of the T of the continuum. Um, they were, in many ways, hierarchical-based programs, um, often had large client numbers, and I guess that's one of the things that differs in the Australian situation to particularly the US, where sometimes the, the program numbers are very high, is that our programs generally don't have very large numbers. They're usually around 50. Um, Odyssey House programs are the exception where both Odyssey Houses take in 100 people. Uh, but generally our programs are based on a family model, on the idea of, of uh, family uh, and, and much smaller sizes. Nevertheless, what we started to see, and Tony Michael Ajenko um, undertook uh, one of the first research programs, uh, papers in 2001, was that um, Many programs gradually kind of move to the centre of the continuum. They're characterised by shorter pro program duration, smaller client numbers, more democratic or consensus-driven practice. Now, you know, taking what Rowdy said yesterday, those of you who were in the workshop yesterday, you know, this idea when we talk about democratic and hierarchical programs, that there's this kind of idea that somehow or other there's no democracy in the hierarchy and there's no hierarchy in the democracy. And, and both of those things are actually not true, because you know what we what we see is that the, the system, in some cases, uh, and I think very much the UK model um, has demonstrated this. In some ways, and particularly in our youth programs, in our prison programs, there's less of a hierarchical structure. There's a flatter structure. Nevertheless, there is still a structure and there is still this kind of idea of stages, um, stage program and also earning responsibility as you go through the program. The other thing that, that I think is interesting, and you know, we've talked about dual diagnosis, or generally what we talk about is co-occurring disorders. Um, the other idea is, and it's always kind of amusing to me, like we've discovered dual diagnosis, we've discovered comorbidity, um, and particularly in the British system, of course, um, the substance use TCs came out of the mental health hospitals initially. So that's, that's you know that's the basis. Of it. Um, and and certainly this idea that comorbidity is the expectation rather than the exception. Is, is something that very much we, you know, we consider when we're looking at a, a, a program, people in our programs. Okay, so this is kind of what we see in Australia. When you think about the evolution of the TC in the last 50 years in Australia, this is kind of what it looks like. So we have, uh, for the want of a better word, modified TCs which very much take in all, all these. So we have specific programs that are working with adolescents. Um, we have some specific programs with people with co-occurring disorders. But as well as that, obviously, people with co-occurring disorders are also in the mainstream programs as well. We now have a lot of transitional programs. So these are short term. They might only be eight to 12 weeks. But the idea is that someone is trans, trans, transitioning. So in fact, a, a lot of our detox programs have now become transitional programs rather than detox programs. Because one of the things that um, you know, we, we, we need to be emphasising to people is detoxification is not a program. It's actually it's a gateway um, and it's an introduction. So a lot of our, um, a lot of our detox or withdrawal programs um, or services have now started to become transitional programs. So they're up to eight weeks of duration, and the idea is then that people are moving into another stage of treatment after that. We have gender-specific programs, so we have men-only programs, we have women-only programs, and within our family programs, we many of our programs will take um, women and children 
or they'll take couples with children, so men and women with children, um, and also couples, including same-sex couples with and without children. So family programs are very much part of part of our model and have been so for a long, long time. I set up a family program in 1988 in, uh, in uh, Canberra, but there were family programs established prior to that time. There's also faith-based TCs, so United Care, Salvation Army, Catholic Church, the Anglican Church and other Christian-based, and they're primarily Christian-based programs <coughs> in Australia that are running uh, the TC model as well. And then the democratic concept based TCs, particularly in prison, some community and hospital based programs where there's a lot of psychoanalytic work, IPT, um, and also um, you know, growing uh, psychosocial models. And then criminal justice based TCs as well. So some of those are community based and some of those are within prisons. Um, particularly in New, in New Zealand, the New Zealand government has been incredibly good at encouraging TCs um, and actively, um, you know, call for tenders from uh, therapeutic communities to work in partnership with um, corrections um, to to establish TCs. Mind you, they're, they're generally referred to as drug treatment units, DTUs. Um, but within our membership, uh, there are 10 therapeutic communities in prisons in New Zealand, and there are three in prisons in uh, Australia. So that's kind of what the landscape is looking like and how it's evolved in Australia over the last 50 years. Going? Okay. So what we started to see over time was as programs spread along the continuum, they started to drift towards the centre and there was beginning to be a noticeable change in the characteristics uh, with that defined a therapeutic community. And these you know, concerns have come up, George has uh, you know, articulated them very well in terms of uh, what has happened with the model over time. So there's been a bit of a drift in the model, um, in part due to individual service development. Certainly funding constraints come into this. You know, one of the things that happens is too, that when the research looks at what's the length of stay, um, you know, they'll come up, or across the world, they'll come up with the fact that generally people stay for around three months. And so therefore, there's this kind of idea that, oh, well, that's, they only need three months treatment. Um, what we know and what you know is that people are continually kind of moving through this process um, and of course at the very end when they finally get their act together and they do well, that particular modality claims success and it might have been a brief intervention at the very end um, but it also might have been a TC or it might have been another modality. What we need, what we, what we do know is that that all of those kind of experiences that people have of recovery, uh, you know, work together so that you get that kind of um, final effect. The thing that uh, was interesting in Australia a couple of years ago, we, um, the government um, established a working group that I was on. It been worked for two years. And our brief was we had to work up uh, a model of, of um, of care, clinical care model, uh, was known as the DUCUP project, the Drug and Alcohol Clinical Care Programs, um, and it was based on the MUCUP, which was a mental health um, clinical care. Um, and so our brief was this, you've been parachuted into a community of 100,000 people. What you have to t tell us is, of those 100,000 people, who is going to need drug treatment and what kind of drug treatment are they going to need? And we had to then model this, you know, this thing became a kind of a spreadsheet that went across the room. What we had to model was um, the, the different types of treatment that people would need over that period of time. So immediately you say, okay, X percentage don't need any treatment. They'll do, you know, we'll give them a... <coughs> you know, prevention. 
they'll get prevention information. And so when it comes down to it, we had calculated that around 10 to 25% are going to need therapeutic community treatment. And so we then, we then had to model what that would look like. And it was kind of interesting for the rest of the, the group. You know, this was a group that came from all different areas of um, medical and homelessness and all sorts of different areas of the community. Um, it was a big working group. And, um, and they couldn't get over the fact that we had 24 hours treatment. And how were we going to actually cost this out? And, and the interesting thing was that as we went through it, um, and people became more and more aware about actually what was happening in a therapeutic community and what that treatment meant, and who was providing the treatment, that you, you know, a lot of it was peer driven. Um, one of the things that also became obvious to them and to us was that depending on, on the drug, then you needed different you needed different interventions. So people, for instance, who had alcohol problems often had to have more medical treatment because they were, their bodies were in, you know, they often, often had um, uh, poor liver function and so on. Um, and so it was a, a really interesting project and what has happened from that is that governments across Australia now have this as a model on which they have to, well, they don't have to, but on which they're encouraged to base their funding. And the interesting thing in Victoria, for instance, is that for the first time in a long time, uh, Victoria is actively setting up therapeutic community beds and calling for more TCs to be set up. So there's, there was a real recognition through that process that the TCs were working with the most um, you know, most needy group of people. So the people who are at the, you know, the point in the end in terms of their disorder. So, you know, one of the things that we've been concerned about as an association right from the beginning of time of uh, setting up is about quality standards. Um, and one of the things that uh, the government is also, as a consequence, concerned about is, is the same thing. And you saw in that earlier slide that uh, was, uh, was presented um, earlier in that first session about the rise in methamphetamine use in Australia. So, in, in actual fact, it's come down from what was shown in that slide. Nevertheless, uh, it was enough that the Government of Australia became concerned and set up an ICE task force. And the ICE task force has been very active in terms of um, looking at what are the what are the, the possibilities of funding and what do we need to do in terms of uh, treatment. Um, now, the unintended and negative consequence of all this is that there has been a huge demand, increased demand for beds, because you know initially people said, oh, they're going to just need a brief intervention. Well, guess what? People didn't didn't just need a brief intervention, they actually needed residential treatment. And so a lot of kind of cowboys have set up, um, they don't come from America, these cowboys, they're, you know, Australians. <laughs> uh, well, some of them might come from America, but, you know, generally they, they've kind of, you know, they've, they've set up, they've looked at this as a business opportunity, not a health treatment. And I don't know if your countries have the same problem where, uh, unregulated services get set up. And so there's been a bit of an increase in these unregulated services in Australia, and the government is really concerned about it. Um, and so that actually was, again, one of the things that uh, came to us in terms of uh, their support for us to develop standards. So, as I said, since 1986, a major concern for us has been the implementation of program evaluation processes. We set off, we, we started initially by doing peer reviews, and so as the program was set up, a review team, a peer review team would go in and have a look at what they were doing and review all of their, their uh, policies and so on, um, and, uh, and give them feedback about how they were operating as a therapeutic community. And that has become more formal, whoops, does not want to move, okay. 
that's become more formal over time. So these are the objectives of the peer review, establish a common understanding of continuous quality improvement and what that might look like, um, to review the TC standards, the expectations of the Australasian TC uh, sector to meet those standards, to review the, the support package, uh, allow discussion and so on. So all of these things became uh, important and we also, they also related to our different um, levels of, um, uh, of membership of the ATCA. We also, during this time, so initially, uh, the first work that we started to do in this area was 2002, and we had a project called the Towards Better Practice in Therapeutic Communities. And it was really um, an initiative of the ATCA to sort of stop that cultural drift as TCs diversified in Australia. And we were concerned to look at how the essential elements could be applied in the Australian context. So we looked at the study that um, uh, Melnick, uh, De Leon and so on had, uh, had undertaken initially. And they, of course, had come up with 139 essential elements, um, which then form the SEEK, the, um, uh, the questionnaire of essential elements. <coughs> What we found when we undertook this project, and it was, uh, it was a very um, detailed research project, is that in fact we, we found that we could come up with, of those 139 uh, essential elements, uh, they were reduced to 79 with three broad categories. Uh, with subcategories of related elements. I can let people have copies of those if, if you're interested later on. And they came under three broad headings, TC ethos, aspects of program deliver delivery and quality assurance. And recommendation two coming out of the Towards Better Practice uh, project was that consideration needed to be given to which components of the MEEC uh, are most, and this was called the MEEC because it was the modified essential elements questionnaire, are most relevant to routine monitoring and quality assurance aspects. Uh, and extraction of those components into a much shorter instrument is desirable for efficient application. So the idea was that we would then come up with the essential elements which TCs would adopt within their program and they would also form the basis of um, the TC standards. They, the word modified became confusing because people confused it with therapeutic communities, which were sometimes called modified therapeutic communities, and so we've now called them the Australasian Therapeutic Communities Essential Elements, or the ATCs. Um, and so they form, as I said, the basis of uh, everything that we've done from here on. So within the consultation that informed the development of the original TC package, uh, it became evident that uh, the sector still didn't have a sense of ownership of the MEEC, and that's why, you know, one of the reasons it became changed to the Australasian TC essential elements. And this is, this is what they consist of. So the first one, TC ethos, reflecting the nature of the TC environment, which provides background context to the intervention. And the things that we're looking at there is the nature of substance abuse and recovery, the broad concept of TC approach, dimensions of socialisation, psychological behavioural dimensions. The second one is around aspects of program delivery. And these are very important then in terms of the TC standards because it's really about ensuring a safe environment, encouraging community spirit, sense of belonging and so on. The program structure comes into that as well. And the third one is about quality assurance, and these are more routine aspects that are important to ensuring that TCs operate in accordance with current healthcare standards. So in June 2008, the Australian Department of Health and Ageing surprised us somewhat by providing um, funding to us to develop the national standards for therapeutic communities in Australia. Um, and it was seen as part of a, a national um, uh, standards, uh, kind of overall development uh, quality framework, um, which in fact is still in the process of being completed. 
One of the things that they were then concerned about, and this, be, this has become more highlighted, as I said, with the rise of uh, unregulated services, is that they wanted to see these not just applicable to TCs, but more broadly to other residential programs, with the idea that they wanted to be then pushing these out to the community to say, this is a way that we will um, you know, we will look at your standards, your quality standards uh, within your program as well. So that's in fact what we did. So first of all, we had Jill Rundle, who is the CEO of uh, Wanada, is the West Australian Network of Alcohol and Drug Agencies. So she took leave from her position for a year. She was contracted to us for the whole of 2009 and she worked on developing the TC standards and a support package. Um, it was overseen by a subcommittee of the ATCA board and the original set had uh, eight areas um, that the literature identified certainly as being significant to the healthcare sector. Um, the idea was right from the very start was that they were going to complement what other um, service standards were already in place because you know one of the things that we were hearing from people and this is particularly applicable in New Zealand is that um, certainly in the Australian situation, in the New Zealand situation, you can't get government funding unless you have quality assurance process. <coughs> you have to be accredited in order to get government funding. Um, and so we, we also didn't want to duplicate, therefore, the sorts of things that were happening uh, already as part of uh, a, a quality assurance process. So the TC standards really, when you come, when when you look at them, and in fact, what I'll do, Gary, if I can give you this, that you might just have a look at, and then just pass it on. So that's the that, these are the TC standards. You can see it's a very small booklet, and the reason it's a very small booklet is that it's accompanied by interpretive guides, and I'll get to that as well. Okay, so this is what it looked like. In the first stage, if you went onto our website, you logged into our website, you would be able to go through each of these things. These are the modules, community as method, staged approach, holistic and multi-dimensional approach, and so on. And so you could click on each of those and you would have a whole lot of information on, on uh, each of those standards. Um, it was an all-encompassing quality assurance standard which incorporated generic uh, governance and management requirements. Now, because we have different states and territories in Australia, each of them, some of, our, some of the, the things that happen in Australia are controlled by the federal government and some of them are controlled by the state government. And so things like work, workplace uh, health and safety were controlled by each of the states and territories. So when we went somewhere, we would have to know, in order to pass this organisation, we'd have to know about the legislation in each of the states and territories. And that became obviously not feasible. And so this is why then, in the next iteration, um, we decided that um, most organisations, member organisations, didn't need to undertake a full accreditation because they already had that in place as part of their industry requirement in order to get government funding. Um, and so we then resolved to further refine the standard and to take out those elements um, and just to keep the ones that directly related to the therapeutic community model and particularly as community's method, community's method uh, on the basis for the treatment model. So Rebecca Davey and then uh, Barry Evans, who was a long time CEO of the Buttery, and he's now actually the projects, uh, the standards project officer, um, undertook that. Barry had been very much the guiding force in this since 2002 anyway, uh, when he was part of the ATCA board. And so what we ended up with is the standard that you see um, supported by uh, interpretive guides. So, as I said, you know, one of the things that was a push was that we needed to make this relevant to residential services um, that wish to be accredited <coughs> as a generic residential rehabilitation service, 
as well as to therapeutic communities. And this was very much at the uh, request of the Australian Government. Um, and, and so one of the things then, of course, that we looked at is that as we changed that, we also realised we needed to think about our membership categories. Now this is, you know, I, I know this, this is even amongst my board, this was a hotly debated issue. Do we allow anyone, do we allow more than just therapeutic communities into an association that's called Australasian Therapeutic Communities Association? Um, and so we debated this one backwards and forwards a lot and eventually decided, yes, the membership would change, or the membership categories would change, um, with the idea that um, services coming in as residential services, residential rehabilitation services, uh, came in on the basis that they were working towards becoming therapeutic communities. And that gave them the opportunity, of course, to then get support from us in order to do that. So these, broadly speaking, is now what we have. We have therapeutic communities that are organisational members. We have therapeutic communities that are group members, so they have more than one location. We have residential services, and we also have affiliate members, which are both individuals and organisational. And again, you can see that uh, they break down uh, if you're a therapeutic community that has gone through the ATCA standards, you're a certified therapeutic community. So Charlie Blatch has just come in just before, and he runs Goldbridge, and, uh, and Goldbridge was in fact the first TC that went through that process and is now a certified therapeutic community. So in terms of the residential rehabilitation service category, uh, the, they are able to join the ATCA, as, as I said, in their own right, and they undertake the first six expectations. So when you go through the, the standards, you'll see the first six, and then the seventh one is about community as method. And there are 13 expectations altogether. If you're going to be certified as a therapeutic community, you need to do the whole 13 and you need to achieve at least 80% of all of the um, essential elements, the essential expectations or criteria. Uh, if you're a residential program, you do the first six. Now, this has actually been an incredibly positive thing that happened for us because what it has done is encouraged Aboriginal communities to come into the into the um, into the membership, um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about uh, the difficulty of uh, you know working with uh, with those communities. But now what we have in our membership is six programs that specifically work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, and they're situated at the very top of the, of the Cape in, in, um, in Queensland, down a bit further at Mount Isa, they're in the middle of Australia in Alice Springs, they're right over at the very top of a place called the Andina in, in Roeburn in the top of Western Australia, uh, they're down in South Australia, um, and so we have six programs that are specifically <coughs> working with Aboriginal communities. And we also have, um, we've encouraged, managed to encourage other programs to also uh, increase their, their um, membership with Aboriginal residents as well. And so, uh, again, uh, a residential service can become, um, they come in as an associate member, uh, but they can become a certified residential rehabilitation service. Now, people are actually kind of falling over themselves trying to get into the OTCA now. Uh, and I, and uh, again, we have, a pretty, we have a pretty strict kind of criteria to come in. Um, because, you know, one of the things that, again, was uh, potentially a problem here is that um, organisations that were being set up, particularly private organisations being set up, you know, were wanting to um, have their badge it's a bit like the Made in Australia badge. In fact, 
we kept finding that the ATCA badge was appearing on people's websites when they weren't ATCA members and there was a few times I had to kind of get to the point of almost threatening legal action unless they took it down. Because they were seeing it, that if we put this up, people will think we're legit. Um, and we were saying, no, you have not passed the membership criteria to come in. So although we've kind of opened the membership criteria, we actually have also tightened it in lots of ways too, in that uh, around quality assurance. So, ATCA standard, the overview, the first edition included 13 performance expectations, 23 performance objectives, 51 essential criteria and 11 good practice criteria. Now remember I said that you had to get 80% of those 51 essential criteria in order to be actually certified. So over this last year, we've, we've done seven certifica certification audits. Uh, and ATC members who have completed this program, uh, process have become certified TCs. In our membership, we have 42 members, but between them, they operate 76 therapeutic communities. So some of our, um, some of our programs, for instance, some of our members have a number of different locations. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, Care NZ in New Zealand, which uh, operates within the prison system, had eight prison prisons. Actually, they've lost some in the last uh, year, but they've moved over to Odyssey House or moved over to other TCs. So some some have quite a number of uh, locations, and some are just single site. But generally speaking, what we're seeing is that more and more are becoming group members uh, and operating more than one TC. And this is now the second edition of the standard, which I'm passing around now. And so this has got 13 performance expectations, 23 performance objectives, 30, uh, 50 of which are essential criteria, and 11 which are good practice criteria. Again, we still have the two tiers, the performance expectations, one to six for resi rehabs, and the performance expectations, one to 13 for TCs. The ATCA standard is supported and accompanied by an interpretive guide which lays out the evidence needed to meet each of the performance expectations and criteria. And I'm going to give Gary this one as well. This is the youth guide. The youth guide, and I'm sorry, they, they photocopied it. It could have been double-sided, so it's quite thick. <laughs> and therefore, no staple would go through it. So, pass that round. <coughs> And now that you've seen what the standard looks like, you can see what the interpretive guide looks like. So basically what the interpretive guide does, it lays out the evidence needed to meet, your, to, needed to meet each of the performance expectations and criteria. So they've, at the moment we've developed them for TCs and residential services working with adult youth and Indigenous populations. I haven't brought the Indigenous one with me because it's in its final consultation process with uh, our Aboriginal programs. And we're also working on a fourth one at the moment for prison-based TCs. Now, you might say, so why do you need all those? But you would know yourself that what the way in which you're working, and those of you who are working in a prison would, would know this, that, that you know, sometimes the way in which you do things within the prison because of the nature of the prison, are different, you know. So if I was to go in, I'd never been into a prison TC before, and I was going to apply what I knew about how people would, I'd be saying, why aren't they working in the garden? Why aren't they cooking in food? Why aren't they doing all of these things? Why aren't they, you know, what, what's, what's going on with the groups? Why aren't they doing the same kind of groups? So the subtlety sometimes about how you how you do things within different environments uh, are different uh, and also within our youth TCs as well. We have two specific youth TCs, or three actually, three specific youth TCs um, in Australia and they've got two in uh, New Zealand. So performance expectations one to six applicable to resi rehabs as I said and seven to thirteen to TCs. Um, the idea too then is that you also, um, the, the, um, uh, 
the idea about uh, industry accreditation is really important um, and as I said people have to be have industry accreditation uh, and be accredited under that in order to be admitted either as a TC or as a resident rehab in the first place. They can come in as an affiliate member with the idea then that they're working towards because they might be just in the early stages of uh, setting something up. So for agencies that have participated in other quality certification programs in addition to the essential criteria, and that's what's expected of a service meeting this performance expectation, there's a, there's a further set of criteria called good practice. And what they are intended to reflect is sometimes referred to as system and systems elements. They're primarily related to monitoring and evaluation of uh, agency uh, practices. So you'll see in the one that I'm going to get you to do uh, as your little task, Community's Method one, that there are both um, essential, um, they're both essential criteria and there's also some good practice criteria as well. Which means that if you've met these essential criteria but you've done this extra stuff in terms of good practice, then you will then be You'll, you'll also then be, um, you know, get that as your tip as well. So these are the performance expectations. Residential community, there's uh, underneath this, there's just one performance objective which talks about the rules and the values of the, in the organisation, but there are three essential criteria. Performance expectation two is about resident member participation, and you can start to see now how these relate back to the essential elements. Um, there's two performance objectives here. The resident member's participation is the central focus to all aspects of the organisation. And there's three essential uh, criteria here. The resident member rights within the resident, residential setting and there's one good practice criteria here. What I should say is when we, we go in to do um, uh, a certification audit, um, the team doesn't just talk to staff, they also meet with the residents. Um, and I was doing one in one of our uh, prisons in um, New Zealand, and much to the horror of all the prison officers and the, and the um, staff, uh, I demanded that I was going to see um, the guys in the prison by myself. I had a colleague with me, but also another female. Um, and, uh, and we conducted the group and, they were, and, and you know, people were saying, you sure you won't do this? Said, yep, this is, what, this, is, this is the way we do it, we just talk to your residents. Um, and so the interesting thing is it's often the residents who have more understanding about what community method is than sometimes the staff. Um, and especially when you have staff who are coming in who haven't been you know, haven't had a, a good basis of training within the TC. So performance expectation three is about strategic human resource management. There are, again, three objectives here. Organisations recruitment is based on gaining the best outcomes for the organisation. There's three essential criteria. Staff provided with appropriate support to undertake their role within the organisation, three essential criteria. Human resource processes allow for ongoing development of staff there's three essential and one good practice criteria. Performance expectation four, information management and appropriate use and evaluation of data. So we have a, a big emphasis on collecting, um, I mean there's some data that has to be collected as part of something called the National Minimum Data Set, has to be collected for the government, but we also have a big emphasis on research, trying to get research and information systems within the TC as well. The organisation maintains an appropriate database that allows for service evaluation for essential criteria. Um, the organisation ma maintains all client records according to organisational policy and the re relevant <coughs> jurisdictional legislation to essential criteria. And then there's workplace uh, health and safety. I won't go through them each. Um, and then performance expectation, health and safety, risk management. Now, if you do all this and you've got those six, then you will get that logo on your website, which says you're a residential rehabilitate, you're a certified residential rehabilitation services member. 
If you go on then and you do the next lot, you can then become a certified TC. And I'll spend just a bit of time on, these one, on this one, the community as method, because this is the one that I want you to be looking at. Is that already one o'clock? Yes. Right, okay. All right, perhaps I won't in that case. We're going to finish at half past one, do we? Or we must, we must have started late, surely. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, okay, let me, just, let me just talk about this one and then I'll get you to do these worksheets. Okay, so community as method must be achieved if a service is to be accredited as a, a therapeutic community. This is not one where you have any wiggle room, okay? So, performance expectation 7.1, the, the TC program applies the community as method approach. These are the essential elements. Okay, they must apply the community as method approach and of course there's a whole lot of literature about what that means that they already have. They, they have distinct stages which cover assessment, orientation, treatment, transition and re-entry. Um, sometimes that's, that word is, is used differently. Interestingly enough, we don't talk about aftercare, we talk about continuing care. Um, therapeutic community approach is multidimensional. It involves therapy, education, teaching values and skills development. And then there's good practice criteria as well. Establish culturally appropriate community suitable encounter measures. So the encounter group is there, but we talk about these need to be culturally appropriate and community suitable. Agency de uh, demonstrates a community that is self-reliant and self-aware. And the resident groups charged with assessing readiness for stage change. Uh, and providing feedback on progress through those stages. And then there's performance objective 2, 7.2, um, which uh, talks about the essential elements and so on. Um, okay, so let's, what I would like you to do is to just try and work through, let's, a couple of these, okay? We won't get through the whole sheet. So if you can, kind of get yourself into your group, whether you're not going to break up your chairs and what you want to do. And what I'm going to get you to think about is your community. So the agency operates in a manner that reflects the community as method approach and implements that in all aspects of the service. This is the first key objective. The TC program applies the community as method approach. What I want you to then think about is what are the key activities or processes in your TC? If I was coming into your TC, how would I know you do community as method? What would I have to look at? How would you demonstrate that? Okay? What written or observational evidence might you use to substantiate your claims? So I'm going to go into groups, I'm going to see what happens. If I walk into a, a, a TC and, you know, there's a professional, um, uh, you know, receptionist sitting behind the desk and there's no, no um, sight of residents around, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think, how are the residents involved here, okay? So things, you know, think about, think about how that might that might operationalise. See if you can do A, applies the community method approach, and B, um, distinct stages which cover, which it says which over, but it should say cover, assessment, orientation, treatment, transit, and re-entry. Okay, do you want to do that bit of a task?